Well, on this stormy night, we're in Quebec City as Canada officially welcomes the G7 leaders. They made nice for the cameras, but what about the mood behind the picture postcard scene? And we take our coverage street level where protesters try to make their case. Measuring success inside the secure zone and out. Also tonight, as the Doug Ford era is set to begin in Ontario, at issue is here tonight for a look at what it means for Canada. Plus, the life and death of an American cultural phenomenon. Anthony Bourdain used his love of food and storytelling to make connections in a diverse world. Why he meant so much to so many tonight. This is The National. We are in the Quebec capital again tonight, where, as you can probably tell, it's suddenly gotten very windy. While the G7 leaders are meeting 150 kilometers away in the remote Lamal Bay Resort area, there has been a flurry of activity here throughout the day from government officials, media from around the world, and occasionally confrontation between police and protesters. They wanted this to be a day of disruption, but the hundreds of anti-G7 demonstrators who turned out today were outnumbered by police. We'll have more on that in a moment, but first to the summit itself. And on day one of the meeting, all eyes were on Donald Trump, already the odd man out in the group. He went and picked a new fight even before he arrived. But by this evening, Trump sure seemed to be making nice. Our coverage begins with the CBC's David Cochran. Obviously, uh, trade has been a topic of discussion and will continue to be, but... After a week of tweets, tariffs and turmoil, finally some laughs. Justin has agreed to cut all tariffs <laughs> and all trade barriers <laughs> between Canada and the United States, so uh, I'm very happy so about that. So I'd say that. NAFTA's in good shape. But we are actually working on it. A light moment on a heavy but, topic. Uh, our relationship is very good. We are actually working on cutting tariffs and making it all very fair for both countries. Nice words, but the tariffs are still there and NAFTA is still in limbo. And while the G7 can happily pose for a family photo, this is still a family with problems. Even before he made his way to La Malbe, the black sheep of that family jolted the G7 once more. They threw Russia out. They should let Russia come back in because we should have Russia at the negotiating table. He's already started a trade war. He now wants the group to reopen its arms to Russia, which was kicked out of the former G8 four years ago for annexing Crimea and is the prime suspect in multiple attempts to hack Western elections. But let's leave seven as it is. It's a, it's a lucky number. The idea of adding Russia flopped with the leaders of the EU. It was flatly rejected by Canada. Russia, however, made clear that it had no interest in behaving according to the rules of Western democracies. The unpredictability highlights the challenges the G7 leaders face in dealing with the U.S. president, who can be tougher on his allies than his enemies. In today's meeting, which sources say were cordial, the other leaders tried to convince the president to drop his tariffs and stop a trade war. So a smiling and joking Trump emerged, the angry tweeter nowhere to be seen. There was even a hint of compromise. We'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys. I think guys we'll tomorrow. have a joint session. And earlier this evening, I spoke to David, who is at the summit site. David, what do we know about what happened in the private meeting between Trudeau and Trump after the cameras left? Well, Ian, officials are saying it was a positive and constructive meeting, and the two leaders have agreed that they would accelerate the NAFTA talks, but we are being cautioned by Canadian officials to take that with a grain of salt. We have heard this before. It hasn't always gone that way, but there is at least a sense after a tough week of goodwill between the two countries while the leaders are meeting here face-to-face. -face. The question is if that goodwill remains after Donald Trump leaves Quebec and gets back on Twitter. And there was doubt about a final joint communique. What are we hearing about that now? 
Yeah, the president suggested that maybe there could be a joint statement, but the president says a lot of things that don't often come true. There is deep doubt here amongst Canadian officials that that could happen because there are still deep divisions on two key issues, trade and climate. The U.S. delegation is insisting that the final document has no reference whatsoever to tariffs and trade. The other six nations are balking at that. It's a non-starter for them, and that could be what causes them to uh, not have a United statement when this G7 meeting ends. Now, for some, hosting the G7 summit here might conjure up images of past chaos, like those violent protests at the Summit of the Americas in 2001. Well, so far, history has not repeated itself. Not that there haven't been skirmishes between police and protesters. There have been. But other images we've seen today paint a relative calm, rather Canadian portrait. A riot officer chatting with a woman on a bench. Protesters demonstrating in front of Tim Hortons. And our Jayla Bernstein was on the streets today where the protesters made their voices heard, or at least they tried to. Here's how she saw the day unfold. They promised a day of disruption. But while protesters did what they could to send their message, they were hampered, often outnumbered, by an intimidating wall of police. A game of cat and mouse played out through the day. Pop-up demos appeared. Police declared them illegal. This demonstration has been declared unlawful. Protesters dispersed, and then it happened all over again at another flashpoint. Lulls in the action, followed by standoffs. In one residential alleyway, police swept through with a canine unit, cornering protesters at a dead end. At least three were taken into custody. But what stood out the most was the contrast. This heavy police presence tracking every move of a small group of protesters. Not what freedom of expression should look like, says this woman. You're here, aren't you, Amnesty International, she says. Amnesty is here and it doesn't like what it's seen. One of the um, principles uh, that we believe the authorities should be following is um, to have a, a presence that corresponds to the wrist. And so we believe that this is not what we've seen today. She's concerned that heavy-handed security is simply shutting people down. Some of them uh, feared uh, coming in the streets even before the G7. Uh, what we have denounced, of course, is kind of a climate of fear uh, that happened before the G7, not only uh, from, of course, articles that we found in the media, but also uh, statements and severe security measures. They say the job of police is not just to protect the public, but also the rights of those protesting. And with more demonstrations planned for tomorrow, Amnesty says it'll be watching. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Quebec City. Later on the National, more from the G7. For many of those protesters, world leaders won't even see or hear their message. So what motivates them to demonstrate? And he was a chef, a TV host, and a talented storyteller who connected legions of fans with world culture through food. We look at the legacy of Anthony Bourdain. But first, Ontario voted for change, and they sure got it in Doug Ford. So what comes next? A good, hard look at the books, as it turns out. Here's Hannah Thibodeau. He didn't take much time to celebrate his big win. i got to apologize. My voice is a little hoarse this morning. Just over 12 hours after winning a resounding majority, Premier-designate Doug Ford got right down to business. He and his team started the transition to take over from the defeated Liberals. After a, a hard-fought campaign, we know the hard work has just begun, but we intend to act fast. The Tory leader didn't say just how quickly he'll move on big campaign pledges, like cutting gas taxes by 10 cents a litre, scrapping the current sex education curriculum, and lowering taxes for the middle class and corporations. Ford says the transition will take about 21 days, and in that time, he and his team will start looking at Ontario's books and figure out who will be in his cabinet. Once he is sworn in, that's when Ford goes from designate to premier. But right now, his team says, 
It's about coming to grips with the province's financial situation. I think it's getting the fiscal house in order. It's making sure that uh, Doug and his transition team get in there and they see uh, the state of, uh, of the books and get right to work. And the spin already? It's not going to be good. And I predict we're going to find out the state of the Ontario finances is pretty bad. Even if the finances are worse than expected, some say Ford will fulfill all of his promises. I think Doug Ford's the type of leader who will pound the desk when people give him excuses about why things are too complicated or why they can't be done. And Doug Ford's going to say, you're going to lose your job if you don't figure out a way to help me keep my promises. Throughout the more than four-week campaign, Ford never provided his party's accounting of its campaign promises, leaving some a bit skeptical of this polarizing political leader. People out there have given me a clear mandate, a very clear mandate to govern. We're going to govern. We have a team ready. Ford may have the team ready, but now he'll have to move from campaign rhetoric to governing. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Toronto. With the Progressive Conservatives ending 15 years of Liberal rule in Ontario, Doug Ford could now find himself, possibly, on a collision course with the federal Liberals. Tonight, Catherine Cullen looks at what that could mean for Justin Trudeau's political goals. Justin Trudeau is dealing with one challenging partner right now in the Charlevoix, but when he gets back home, there's a new neighbour to contend with. I've also spoken with Prime Minister Trudeau. Today, Doug Ford sounded like an ally. I said we'll stand united uh, against our neighbours to the south, and I'm, I'm very sincere when I say that. But while Trudeau seemed to sincerely get along with Kathleen Wynne, there is clearly plenty of acrimony between some federal Liberals and Doug Ford. He is incapable of governing. Why people would uh, embrace such an, uh, a manifestly obvious, unqualified candidate for Premier. And some of Ford's goals could derail Trudeau's agenda. We're going to scrap the carbon tax. We know that putting a price on carbon pollution drives improvements. Trudeau's plan to fight climate change involves every province putting a price on carbon. And if they don't, the Prime Minister says he'll impose it. Which puts them on a kind of a collision course. I think they're going to be in for a fight. Uh, they're going to be in for a fight, certainly in Ontario. Great pleasure. Trudeau's yeah. environment yeah. minister, though, is vaguely optimistic. People say things during the election. I guess we will see uh, what, what the, the plan is. Then there's health care. Well, I, I don't believe in uh, safe injection areas. But the federal government is the one who approves supervised injection sites, and Trudeau's Liberals believe they save lives. And the big news from the last federal budget that the Liberals are eyeing national pharmacare as a pledge in the next election. If Trudeau's plan requires buy-in, especially money from the provinces, it's not clear Ford would be interested in that. Either. In some ways, Ford may have benefited from having Trudeau's carbon tax to campaign against. In 2019, though, the roles will be reversed. So will Ford be a useful foil for Trudeau to campaign against, or just the guy who foils his plans? Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, so that change from red to blue is sure to put federal-provincial relations to the test. And Trudeau could have some more problems to contend with, too. The fact that uh, a 15-year-old government in Ontario was kicked out um, so dramatically, yeah. down to seven seats, mm -hmm. does that bode poorly for you? I don't see any compar valid comparison. Quebec's Liberal Party is going into an election this fall, and Premier Philippe Couillard is trailing in popular support. But the province will also be key to the federal Liberals' 2019 re-election strategy. Alberta's NDP Premier will fight for re-election next spring. Trudeau and Rachel Notley are close allies on the pipeline file right now, but... Stand up to the Trudeau Liberals and defend Alberta. <laughs> Rival Jason Kenney has already promised a more antagonistic approach to Trudeau should his unified Conservative Party win power. So there's some stuff to talk about. What this means for Ontario, what it means for the rest of the country. Thank goodness we've uh, convened a special Friday at issue. Andrew, Chantal, and a slightly sleepy Eric Grenier, he was up late with me last night, are standing by. What do they think will be Doug Ford's first move? 
And later in the hour, we'll have more from Quebec City if the wind doesn't blow our lights <laughs> over. We'll meet some of the protesters trying to make their voices heard from the ground and the sky. And a shocking loss for the culinary world and well beyond. Anthony Bourdain died today. His legacy taking us out of the kitchen and building understanding and connections through food. Even people with whom you have really fundamental disagreements uh, and maybe even complete different belief systems, if you're going to intersect anywhere, it's going to be over food. Friends and fans are expressing shock at the death of celebrity chef and TV travel host Anthony Bourdain. He was found dead in a French hotel room today of an apparent suicide. CNN, which aired his popular program, Parts Unknown, issued a statement saying, his love of great adventure, new friends, fine food and drink, and the remarkable stories of the world made him a unique storyteller. Bourdain's decades-long career took him around the world, and he always seemed to find a way to take us all with him wherever he went, including Canada. The CBC's Stephanie Skinderis looks back at a life lived to the fullest. Here we are, boys, at the ass end of the universe. Anthony Bourdain was never afraid to speak his mind. Country, middle of nowhere, Newfoundland. And when he paid a compliment, you knew it was real. Because let's face it, Newfoundland is... Nope. Incredible. To the Queen. Bourdain's episode featuring Raymond's Restaurant in St. John's aired last month. No, AGM, Chef I'm Jeremy sorry. Charles says it feels like Bourdain was there just yesterday. And we were out having a great time and, and uh, you know, discovering the lay of the land and, and uh, there was no indication or any, I mean, it's the last thing you'd think of, you know. Today, Bourdain's network CNN broke the news of his death. It's maybe so hard to process this today. A woman outside the restaurant where Bourdain once worked says she feels the same. He had just the right amount of uh, cockiness, but not ever being too braggadocious about it. It's a balance Bourdain always seemed to get just right. He was a celebrity chef who wasn't known for his own food. I'm not a culinary genius, you know, far from it. I am, I am a proud craftsman of, of journeyman quality. His real skill was storytelling. After decades of working as a line cook, Bourdain first gained fame for his writing. He was candid about his struggles with drug addiction, and he exposed the harsh realities of New York restaurants in books like Kitchen Confidential. He had such a lasting impact on the way people think of how restaurants work. Try it. But he was best known for connecting with people through food. He could bring Barack Obama to a tiny noodle shop in Vietnam or speak to ordinary people about how their countries shaped their cuisine. He was the first chef who actually uh, really believed that storytelling through food is the best way to communicate uh, people's lives, people's cultures, people's ethnicities, people's behaviors. The trick, Bourdain said, was to keep it simple. Uh, I've gotten along with people everywhere in this world and heard some incredible stories, largely because I sit down without an agenda and just ask the very simple question, what's for dinner, what makes you happy? Anthony Bourdain was 61 years old. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. Now looking back, Bourdain was indeed open about addiction, but also about suffering from depression. He used to describe how being on the road 250 days a year left him feeling lonely and isolated. He even traveled to Argentina to shoot an episode of Parts Unknown and wound up seeing a psychotherapist. Uh, I will find myself in an airport, for instance, and I'll order an airport hamburger. It's an insignificant thing. It's a small thing. It's a hamburger, yeah. but it's not a good one. Suddenly, I look at the hamburger and I find myself in a spiral of depression yes. that can last for days. Now, even still, Bourdain's death comes as a huge shock and on the heels of another high-profile suicide. The world learned of 55-year-old fashion designer Kate Spade's death just a few days ago. And now it's the ripple effect that's raising worries, specifically how all of this affects other vulnerable people. Consider a recent study that found that in the five months after actor Robin Williams ended his own life, the suicide rate in the U.S. jumped 
almost 10%. That is a staggering fact. So we've invited someone to help talk us through this problem that even has a name. It's been called suicide contagion. Mark Senor is a psychiatrist. Mark, you work at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. I'm wondering, from the point of view of someone who is suffering, how can media coverage of a suicide affect them? Well, thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an important topic. And people who are struggling with depression or anxiety or substance use problems um, have thinking errors. Their um, thoughts say to them that, um, at least in some cases, that life isn't worth living, that people don't care about them. Um, but in fact, it's not true. And we know um, that when people come and seek help, uh, that they can get a lot better and that those thoughts can change. Um, so when people see a prominent suicide death in a, a celebrity, uh, they sometimes identify with that and they, they make the mistake of copying that behavior uh, and not realizing that it was a terrible tragedy and that instead they should have sought help. And, you know, when I, when I look at the way the media does cover suicides, particularly high-profile ones, I mean, there is a sensitivity to the approach. I mean, we try to be selective about our coverage, too. And I wonder, is that the right way to go about it? I mean, is there a risk of, of concealing or hiding aspects of depression and suicide in a way that ends up being unhelpful? I mean, should, should everything be out in the open as much as possible? Yeah, I, I, I think everyone is going to find out about these deaths anyway. I don't, I don't think there's a, a desire to conceal them, but I do think there's a desire to contextualize them. We have to understand that the over, overwhelming majority of people who think about suicide ultimately find resilience. They find, um, you know, paths to resilience, and they don't die by suicide. Um, and there was actually research that was done in Europe which showed that after media reported on what typically happens, which is uh, people thinking about suicide but seeking help and, and getting better, that there was actually actually a, a reduction in suicides across the entire country of Austria. And so what we're really hoping is just that you present things as they are. You know, we always hope there are teachable moments uh, when something like this happens. How should people start to help others that they suspect may need help? I don't think we're expecting everybody to become psychologists or psychiatrists, uh, but usually if someone around you is, is depressed or anxious or withdrawing or using more substances, uh, people pick up on it. And I think that what people can do is just to, to listen, to, to be there and to uh, approach the person and, and to say that you care, that they're an important person, uh, that you're interested in helping them. Um, and maybe just talking could be enough for some people to help with a suicidal crisis. And for other people, um, if that's not working, then to encourage them to, to reach out, to, uh, to call a crisis line or to go to an emergency department. There is hope. Mark, indeed. Mark Senor, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. So, in this country, for every suicide death, there are as many as 20 attempts. And to Mark's point, if you or someone you know are at risk, there are definitely places you can go for help. You can call the Canada Suicide Prevention Service, or if you're in Quebec, you can call 1-866-APPEL. And later on The National, a side to Bourdain not everyone knows about, as described by one very special food critic. Bourdain came to her defense in a big way after her glowing review of The Olive Garden it was mercil mercilessly mocked online. You'll hear how they found common ground in our moment of the day. Oh my gosh, Bourdain and the Olive Garden, perfect. And the Ad Issue gang's all here. What else could they be talking about? The Ontario election. So what will be Doug Ford's first order of business? After a hard fought campaign, we know the hard work has just begun. Tonight on The National, more legal trouble for the U.S. president's former campaign chairman. Special counsel Robert Mueller hit Paul Manafort today with new obstruction charges for allegedly trying to get witnesses to lie for him. That's on top of the criminal charges he already faces for his foreign lobbying work. Also charged with obstruction today, Manafort's longtime associate, Konstantin Kalimnik. He said to have ties to Russian intelligence, something he has denied. Certainly, his memory is very popular now. I'm thinking about Muhammad Ali. So that was President Trump earlier today saying he's thinking about a posthumous pardon for the boxing legend. Ali was convicted in 1967 after refusing military service in Vietnam. But in a statement, the Ali family's lawyer said, thanks, but a pardon isn't actually necessary. Ali's conviction was overturned almost 50 years ago. 
And former NBA star Dennis Rodman has put an end to the speculation, announcing he will, in fact, be in Singapore for the upcoming summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un. The U.S. president said he was not invited to the meeting, but Rodman, considered a personal friend of Kim's, says he'll be there to provide, quote, whatever support is needed. The summit is set for next Tuesday, June 12th, local time, which is Monday night here in Canada. I've also spoken with Prime Minister Trudeau. I've laid out my priorities for the people of Ontario. I made a commitment to work closely with our federal partners to support them with the ongoing negotiations with our neighbours to the south and work together to deliver on our plan for the people of Ontario. I told the Prime Minister that we will make Ontario the engine of Canada once again and what is good for Ontario is good for Canada. That was Ontario's premier designate, Doug Ford, the day after his party swept into government, a result that many expected. But could it signal a growing divide in the country between provinces? What does it mean for Ontario? What does it mean for Canada? At Issue is here on a rare Friday night to dig into it. Andrew Coyne is in studio with me, and so is CBC's poll analyst Eric Grenier. He has barely slept, but he's here anyway. And Sean Talibert is in Montreal. There's like there's a lot going on politically, but we're just going to do the whole panel on 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 Ontario because it was such a big night. Um, I'll start with you, Andrew. Let, let's start with the Ontario part. How big a shift are we going to see in this province? Uh, nobody knows. Uh, the Conservatives under Doug Ford ran on a very vague and shifting platform. Some parts of it were from the previous leader, Patrick Brown. Some parts of it were improvised on the fly. Very hard to read exactly what their numbers meant. Uh, so they've, they've got lots of latitude. Vaguely speaking, it was somewhat more conservative than the other parties. It may prove to be forced upon them to be more conservative because the province's financial situation is so dire. So. Uh, there's already speculation about which of his extravagant spending promises he's going to have to abandon, for example. Um, but it's certainly going to mean differences in tone and style. Yeah. Chantal, how about, how about you? What, do you? what do you think Ontario looks like, I don't know, 12 months from now even? Oh, that's a, a really good question. And, and I don't think that any of the people who voted one way or the other yesterday have a clear idea of what it's going to look like. Uh, you're going to have to wait for a throne speech and a budget to figure that out because there is nothing and all that was said over the course of the Conservative campaign that would give you a clear indication. And if you compare that to the last time the Conservatives came back to power in Ontario, Mike Harris, common sense revolution, this is something entirely different. Uh, it's it's um, a bit of a blank check, but certainly no blueprint, no, no pun intended, was really put forward. But, it, but it, it, it's a definitive mandate. I mean, we said that last night, Eric, in our coverage. You know, he, we may not know what it's going to look like, but he seems to have the leeway to go ahead and do it. Yeah, that's right. It's a strong result for the PCs. They've won the most seats they have since 1995. But Ford comes in in an interesting position because he's actually still quite unpopular, despite the fact that he did win that mandate. Mm. Polls were showing that a majority of Ontarians disapprove of him or think uh, negatively of him. So that's a weird place to be coming in as an incoming premier to already be more unpopular than popular. We'll see yeah. if those numbers stay uh, like that or not, but it does suggest that he starts out as needing to convince Ontarians that uh, he will be a good premier. That's interesting, yeah. uh, That's right. They won in spite of it rather than because of him. They really won because people had decided long ago that they wanted to get rid of this Liberal government. And there was only a, there was a bit of wavering mid-campaign about that, but basically people had decided they wanted to get rid of the Liberals. And then they also had to decide who they wanted to try and keep the, the, the Tories in check, and it wound up being the NDP. But uh, that, I think, was baked in pretty long ago. So, so let's talk about what it means for, for the country, because certainly, I mean, lots of people watched last night, lots of people had interest in it. Um, and I, I, I am concerned people are making too much of the differences between Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau as though they're not going to be able to do their jobs. But, Chantal, what, what are the complications or the challenges for, for the country with Doug Ford as Premier? Well, if you're, if you're sitting on Parliament Hill and you're the federal liberals in power looking at an election one year down the road, 
The alignment of the provinces has changed and not in your favor on two major files. The obvious one is, is carbon pricing and climate change. Uh, Doug Ford has said he wants to pull Ontario out of uh, the, 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 the carbon measures mm -hmm. that are in place and fight Ottawa in court on that. That tilts the federal-provincial balance. When Justin Trudeau started out, Saskatchewan was the lone outlier. Now, uh, by next year, it could be Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta yeah. if the Conservatives yeah. win. The other file that no one talks about but is also real is Justin Trudeau's stated ambition to put in place a national pharmacare program. For that, you need Ontario buy-in. Uh, and I'm not convinced that this is the kind of government that is going to want to buy into initiatives like that. Yeah, and that's something the NDP and the Liberals were both interested in doing. Okay, w with that in mind, I want to show you a tweet. Andrew Scheer went on a bit of a tweet storm, nothing like Donald Trump, he, just a couple of them today. But he did say this, he said, Ontario took a big step forward last night. Around the country, more and more Canadians are rejecting Justin Trudeau's damaging policies that are making life more expensive and chasing away jobs and investment. Obviously, he's trying to link the Doug Ford win to Kathleen uh, the Doug Ford win, yes, to Kathleen Wynne's loss. Uh, is that pushing it a little too far, Andrew? Yes, and people always do this after elections. They overread them. The, the Tories' average vote in the last few elections was 33%. They went up to 40% this time. But 60% of the public voted for parties that were supportive of climate change measures, et cetera, et cetera. So I wouldn't overread the mandate. But certainly, in the way our system works, he has the power, if he so chooses, to, to put a spanner in the works. I stay tuned on that file. He's certainly been very adamant in saying, I'm, I want no part of cap and trade, I want no part of the federal carbon tax. He's also really going to be fine. He's short up for funds. And is he going to be quite as quick to pass up yeah. $10 billion, I believe it is, of revenues that's collected by another level of government? We'll see. And we should also remember that turnout in the Ontario election was about 58%. So that's significantly, significantly lower than the federal election. So that means there's a lot of people who voted for the Trudeau Liberals in 2015 who didn't go out to vote. Uh, in 2018. So those people might go back out to the ballot next year. So it doesn't mean that because the PCs had 41, 40, 41 percent support in this election means that the Conservatives will get that. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that the federal Liberal brand is still very strong. And a lot of people were voting in this election not because of the Liberals, but were voting because of Kathleen Wynne. So it's not that you can't transfer one to the, uh, to the other. Uh, Rosie, yeah. what's, what was the first thing or almost the first federal thing that happened after Mike Harris won a majority government in Ontario? Jean Chrétien was yes. reconducted for a second majority. So to, to, to take the Ontario result and say this is how things work, if I were the federal conservative leader, I wouldn't want to go there. Okay, l let's talk about the, the two other parties a little bit. We'll start with Andrea Horvath. Um, you know, I said to someone earlier, you know, I think that was a great great night for her, a good win. And then someone said, yeah, but it was the only time she could have possibly won an election and she lost it. I guess that's class half empty. <laughs> but Eric, I, I mean, it, it is a big move from third party to official opposition and it, it allows them to do some some work here in terms of translating that into to more support. I think. Yeah, and I wouldn't consider that this would be the high watermark for the New Democrats. If the Doug Ford government doesn't go very well, in four years, Years, the NDP will be in a strong position because the Liberals will probably be not ready for returning to power. I mean, you can think of what happened to the New Democrats in 2011, but Jack Clayton passed away. It was yeah. a different leader, it was yeah. a different situation. Andrew Horvath, if she is still the leader in uh, 2022 and the PCs have not had a good first term, the NDP is going to be right there. The interesting speculation is what if the NDP had not gone so far left in this campaign? I think they probably felt they had to outflank the Liberals. They didn't want to have happen to them what happened in 2015. But if the Liberals were as out of it from the start as they certainly appear, maybe if they'd been a bit more centrist, the NDP, they might have had a chance because what you saw was they peaked too soon. Yes, in the last yes, few weeks of yes. campaign, there was a strong barrage of advertising raising doubts and fears yeah. about them as being too radical, too extreme. If they'd been positioned more to the center, maybe they would have been able to withstand that. And they seem to realize that, too, that they, the momentum came too soon and they couldn't sustain it. Yes, Chantal? Yeah, it would have helped if they'd been able to feature more of a team. Uh, and, and, of course, her ratings were the best, so it was worth playing her. But at some point, people started asking, well, if I'm going to elect those people, who's the Minister of Finance? Who's going to be the Minister of Health? Uh, and at the point where Doug Ford finally showed up with Caroline Mulroney and, and Christine Elliott. Mm -hmm. That never happened for the NDP. Going back to in four years, A, I'm not sure that uh, a fourth kick at the can is necessarily in the work for Andrea Orwell, but B, if it is, 
remember that the liberals are not going to have much space in that new legislature without official party status, so there is an opportunity there. So, so what happens to them? I mean, that party doesn't go away, it doesn't disappear. <laughs> The unnamed the liberals, you mean? The yes. liberals, I mean, yes. No, I mean, look, we've seen this in, before. The liberal brand in Canada is enduring and strong. There are lots of professional people working for them, et cetera. So I wouldn't count them out. I also wouldn't minimize what just happened. That's the lowest share of the popular vote that any liberal party, federal or provincial, has ever gotten in Ontario in our history. That's a fun fact, yeah. <laughs> That's a Not bad for them, result. <laughs> Eric. Yeah, the liberal brand is very strong. You yeah. can still see in the, in the polling on the federal level that the Trudeau liberals are doing very well in yes. Ontario. So they do still have an opportunity to come back, but it does... It will take a little bit of time. After 15 years in office, people aren't ready to get you back in, and, you know, the next leader might not be a, a star because... Who would want to take over yes, the party no. right now? Yeah, it, there might be like a two-step process it anyway. It often takes yeah. you two or three tries to get the leader that takes you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chantal. Uh, and the nightmare scenario, yes, it's a strong brand, but it's a non-existent or virtually non-existent brand in a number of provinces west of Ontario. Uh, and it, it does exist, the Liberal brand in BC, but let's agree that uh, it yes. was a Conservative party that borrowed the name yes. uh, a few decades ago. So. There is cause to worry for, for the Liberals uh, in this dismal result. Okay, we only have like a minute left, but what, the one thing that you would expect to see Doug Ford do first, and I don't mean name a cabinet, I mean in terms of some sort of policy move that might uh, shake things up. You want to go first, Eric? Uh, uh, maybe Hydro One. He can uh, do that quickly. It was uh, something that he uh, promised that he would do. It cost the government a lot of money, but uh, that was one of, the, one of his main campaign things. Yeah, fire everybody. Uh, Basically, <laughs> one thing he ought to do is bring in a new budget. Um, he's going to have a hard enough time cutting spending as it is. But the Liberals, in their last bro budget, brought in a whole raft of new spending, and it's probably in the Conservatives' interest to try and stop whatever they can before it actually goes out the door, rather than having to cut people who are already yeah. receiving their checks. Et yeah, Chantal. Let me go for the easy thing. As someone who lives in Quebec, bring beer to corner stores. <laughs> a promise made in the 85 campaign by someone called David Peterson. <laughs> but will it cost a dollar is really the question oh, well, we want to know. I, uh, I didn't say a dollar beer. I said just bring it. You know, some of us manage to survive a society. <laughs> I, mean, I his, know. I regret every day that I left Quebec for that reason alone. His slogan is Ontario is open for businesses. Again, I'd like to see Ontario is open for fun again. <laughs> oh, that's so <laughs> unexpected from Andrew Coyne. Okay, thank you all very much. Good news for people who love politics as much as us. At Issue is also a podcast. You get extra content and, of course, the main panel and podcast form every week. This week, the Senate passed the Cannabis Act bill with a few changes. What's next on the road to legalizing? Pot. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Just ahead on the national, we'll take you back to Quebec City, where, if you're keeping track, we seem to be in the middle of a full out gale, and where protesters go all out to grab the eyes and ears of world leaders. We'll ask about their message and their tactics. Attention, attention. This demonstration has been declared unlawful. That's a way of fighting back. It's one of the only outlets they have. And in my opinion, it's legitimate to have those sorts of confrontations when appropriate. So solidarity to the people on the front lines, honestly, good for them. It took me nine and a half years to think of the big idea. The big idea is the software artist. It's an art form. It was an artist's paradise. It was the best game in town. There was these insane artists who created experiences. My goal was I want to make games all day long. That's it. That's the goal. Party collapsed because of greed. Here looking at some of the world's most powerful leaders being whisked through the streets of Quebec City on their way to dinner. Of course, we can't see them. They're sealed away in closely guarded vehicles. And if you were there, they probably wouldn't see you. That's what frustrates protesters at summits like the G7. The leaders are so stringently protected, there is little chance an activist message is going to reach them. We wanted to find out what drives those activists to chase such an unlikely goal. The obvious goal of this early morning protest was to block media and government officials from getting to the summit site in Lamal Bay. But there was also meant to be a bigger message. 
Le capitalisme a tellement peur. There's a whole host of issues in which um, the poor of the world, the global south, and the poor within Canada and the U.S. are being, um, you know, left behind would be, a, a, you know, not not the strongest expression I could use. The main reason why I am here, if I if I can say, is because um, uh, the 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 environmental crisis right now that we are uh, we are seeing in Quebec City this morning scattered confrontations between some protesters and police drew lots of cameras though the message was often not immediately obvious same here though the gentle vibe of this picnic was a lot different it was billed as a place for activists to gather but most people here wouldn't talk to reporters Tessa, who only gave us her first name, explained why she made the three-hour drive to be here during the G7. The goal is to make connections with people and maybe start grassroots organizations and maybe take more actions, maybe even direct actions. Who knows? I mean, I have no confidence in the uh, current government. I don't think many people here do, so we'd like to see some changes there. And if we can discuss those changes together, I think we could come up with good good answers. There are skirmishes going on between different protesters and riot police. You might see the riot police coming by every once in a while. How do you feel about, about those kinds of confrontations? Well, I mean, I'm not personally uh, doing those things right now, but like, I don't know. It, these people, they, that's a way of fighting back. It's one of the only outlets they have. And in my opinion, it's legitimate to have those sorts of confrontations when appropriate. So solidarity to the people on the front lines, honestly, good for them. These young women from across Canada were hoping their symbolic grad celebration would get lots of attention. It's sponsored by the Canadian charity World Vision. They want to highlight the need for girls in the developing world to be able to get an education. All of you are obviously so committed. On the other hand, mm -hmm. not a lot of media, not a lot of attention, and certainly no leaders. Yeah. How, what, what impact do you think this is going to have? We're not here to disrupt, we're not here to be violent, but we're here to say, hey, D7 leaders, this is your opportunity. This is your legacy. 75 million girls, their, their lives can be turned around by you. Um, and so even though there aren't a lot of people today, there's, there's the media, there's our voice, our media, and there are a lot of people that are backing us up. It's not an easy thing getting your message across. Just ask the Council of Canadians, who created this gigantic sign designed to be seen when, or more to the point, if leaders flew by. Perhaps one or two of the leaders at least will get to see it at a certain point um, because, again, you know, we think it's important that they hear something from civil society when they're in their protected, fenced-in, uh, privileged meetings. As unusual as that sign was, the biggest surprise from protesters today was probably how quiet it was, outnumbered in Quebec City by the many police clad in riot gear standing guard. Hey, Rosemary, both you and I were here for the Summit of the Americas back in 2001. So much chaos on the streets in this area, around the hotels, mm -hmm. the clouds of tear gas, and so different this time around. Yeah, it's so unusual and actually quite surprising. I mean, I guess in a good way. I remember not even being able to walk home because of the pepper spray in the air. Yeah. All right, it's windy enough. I'm going to send you <laughs> off, and you can go enjoy a nice Quebec City restaurant and be safe. Thank you for your coverage, Ian. Our moment of the day uh, is next. We hear from a restaurant critic from Grand Forks, North Dakota, who met Anthony Bourdain after he defended her review of, get this, the Olive Garden. It was nothing that I ever would dream about. It just it was something that just happened. But Anthony Bourdain took it upon himself to befriend me, and he liked what I was doing. I've been told a lot that I have pretty eyes. Well, I would love for you to stay. I'm a little family here. For God's sake, get away from the window. Come in. Block of woods over there. So I asked him, where do you want to be? And poof. Self-improvement for people who are not into self-improvement. I can't swim. I am not funny. I would like to help a cow give birth to its calf. Yeah, I think, I think we can help. I that. think we can do that. Here we go.
Tonight on The National, we're keeping an eye on Guatemala's Fuego Volcano after another active day. More evacuations were ordered after it once again spewed lava and ash. At least 109 people have died since Fuego, Fuego began erupting Sunday. And that number is expected to go up because many are still missing. We take our responsibility to reduce our impact on the planet seriously. The latest company to take up the war on the plastic straw. a w Canada made a promise today to eliminate them from its restaurants. The plan is to transition every one of its nearly 1,000 restaurants to biodegradable paper straws. And the company says that will happen by the end of this year. I knew uh, a couple of the guys on the bus, uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, one of those things I want to do for those guys and, uh, you know, the people humbled. And what will be a very special visit for a hockey town struck by tragedy. That was Washington Capitals forward Chandler Stevenson saying he hopes to bring the Stanley Cup to Humboldt, Saskatchewan. As is tradition, each player of the winning team gets the chance to take the cup to his community for a day. And Stevenson, originally from Saskatoon, wants his day to be in Humboldt. No date's been set just yet, though. Okay, I want to read part of a very famous restaurant review for you. The chicken Alfredo was warm and comforting on a cold day. The portion was generous. My server was ready with Parmesan cheese. Now, that's just a small part of a glowing review written by food critic Marilyn Haggerty about the Olive Garden. Now, this was back in 2012, a review for the Grand Forks Herald in North Dakota. That review was mercilessly mocked online. But the man who came to the defense of her eat beat columns, Anthony Bourdain. And we caught up with Haggerty today. That is our moment. And next thing I know, they were telling me I was viral. I didn't know if that meant I was sick. When Anthony Bourdain said my, the Eat Beat was OK, I think a lot of people changed their minds. And they said, yes, we, we, we like the Eat Beat. He asked me to have coffee with him. And I think he kind of wanted to know whether or not I was kooky or what. After we had coffee, he asked if I, uh, he wanted to put together a collection of my Eat Beat columns. Anthony Bourdain took it upon himself to befriend me, and he liked what I was doing today, greatly saddened by his death. And Rosie, it wasn't just the Olive Garden that she reviewed. She reviewed her local KFC, Subway, Taco Bell, McDonald's. But I've read the reviews. I read them today. They are wonderfully earnest, wonderfully detailed. And Anthony Bourdain, the kind of guy who saw a value in that. Yeah, he always said it didn't matter what the food was. It was actually about the context, the moment of sitting down together and breaking bread and sharing that experience, whether it was Taco Bell or the Olive Garden. That's The National for June 8th. Good night. <laughs>